Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of 2016 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The first item of business on the committee's agenda this morning is to consider, sorry, I, I should say we have apologies from our colleague Finlay Carson in the first instance. The first item of business on the committee's agenda this morning is to consider whether to take items 7, 8, 9 and 10 in private. Are we all agreed? We, we're all agreed on that. We now move to uh, agenda item two, Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions target. We will be taking evidence on the greenhouse gas emissions targets. We've been joined this morning by a panel of stakeholders and academics. Uh, welcome, everyone. We have uh, Andy Kerr, the executive director of the Edinburgh Centre for Carbon Innovation at the University of Edinburgh. Robin Parker, public affairs manager at WWF Scotland. Susan Rofe, Professor at the School of the Built Environment at Heriot Watt University. Richard Dixon, the Director of Friends of the Earth Scotland. Robin Matthews, Natural Assets Theme Leader and Climate Change Exchange Coordinator, James Hutton Institute. And Tom Rye, Director of TRI and Professor of Transport Policy, Transport Research Institute, Napier University. Um, I want to encourage short, sharp questions this morning. And if I could say to the panel, you don't have to answer every question or provide a response if you don't feel that you, you have something to contribute. And that way we should make considerable progress on what is a very, very important subject. So kicking off for us this morning uh, with the questions is Kate Forbes. Thanks for being here. This is a question, a more general question, which I would like to direct to each of you. Last week at the committee, we heard evidence from Lord Debin, Chair of the Climate Change Committee, that Scotland is doing better than the rest of the UK. But I'd like to know what your views are on the role that specifically domestic policies have played in reducing Scotland's emissions compared to other factors like warmer winters or a reduced share in EU ETS emissions. Perhaps if I could start with Robin and move down. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I think the, um, the news that we, we are meeting our targets, at least in 2014, is, is very good news. Um, I think there are a few caveats to that, and I'll, I'll talk mostly about the, the agriculture and land use sector rather than the other ones, as that's my, my immediate experience. Um, I think um, I, I think there's a question as to whether the the policies have really had an effect as such. That I think there's been a, a small effect, but um, largely the contribution to the reduction from agricultural land use, I think, is, is due to factors that were happening anyway, um, mostly due to the reduction in livestock numbers uh, over the last uh, couple of decades or so, and also reduction of fertiliser applications too. So I think those things were happening anyway. So one can argue that, uh, in fact, the policies really haven't had too much effect um, in that, that respect. But uh, I think certainly uh, it's good news. And uh, I think those two things are things that we can uh, focus on in the future and, and um, try and, uh, I guess, to uh, use them in such a way to c carry on reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the land use sector. Uh, Lord Deben last week in, in the report from the UK Committee on Climate Change acknowledged that there had been some impact from domestic action. That's certainly true. There's been a the big drop that happened from 2013 to 2014 was clearly mostly to do, to do with the European Emissions Trading Scheme, which is how we account for the energy sector. So not really our energy sector, but what's happening in Europe and what's happening in that trading scheme. So there's some quite artificial things happening in that and also because of some warmer winters, which mean people burn less fuel to keep their homes warm. And um, the emissions trading scheme has some variable things going on at the moment. Some, uh, some permits have been held back, which means our figures look better. They may be released again in, the, in future years. So actually the 2015 numbers, we might see an increase in Scotland's emissions, actually because of things that are happening in the European emissions trading scheme and not really anything to do with anything that we've done. So that's why um, most people are very supportive of the idea that in the new climate bill, we'll have a new accounting system which gives us full credit for actually the very good things we've done in our energy sector, because that is a sector which is very successful in terms of moving towards low carbon, in terms of the growth of renewables, good progress on increasing energy efficiency. Of course, we've closed both of our coal-fired power stations. Closing Longanet will give us... a a reduction in real terms of about 10 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, 
And in the current accounting system, we won't actually see that in our figures, even though that's a very big step that Scotland has made. So in the new system, if that's where we go, we'll see that coming through properly. So in the energy sector, in the waste sector, those are both praised by the UK Committee on Climate Change as areas where Scotland really is doing useful things. But they point at agriculture, buildings and transport as places where we need to do much more, particularly to meet future targets. Uh, and I might uh, finally say that um, in terms of the, the effort that I see going on in Scotland, so I've been tracking climate targets in Scotland for more than 20 years since the, the Labour Lib Dem uh, government first said we might have a climate target right through to the current very detailed process that we have and the Climate Act. And there is probably not another country in Europe where so many civil servants get together and clutch their heads about how they're going to reduce carbon. There is not such an engaging process of stakeholders, at least in previous years, and probably not such a comprehensive thing as the RPP reports. Now, we are not delivering enough, but we have a good process which potentially does lead to good delivery. So I think there's cause for optimism that in this third RPP, which is going to be called the Climate Change Plan, we will see a credible plan to actually deliver on targets. Thank you for asking me. Now, the domestic sector is responsible for about 30% of all the um, emissions from Scotland, I believe. And of those emissions, about 66% goes in space heating, 16% in water, 3% in cooking, and 15% in lighting and appliances. Homes to Scotland are incredibly important because the citizens are important to their legislators. We have around about an average of 30% fuel poverty in um, the households across Scotland and in some deprived areas, for instance, of Dundee, I should think in rural Loch Arbor too, you know, the, the, the um, percentages are higher. So homes really matter. Now, in terms of, I think, all the, the move to renewables, you know, from, you know, another 30% more renewables in the last um, five, six years, um, has masked a significant problem in the domestic sector. Um, we are controlled by legislation via um, Europe. And if you look at the legislation we have at to hand to manage the domestic sector, you've got the European Building Directive, which is concentrated on certification to improve the stock incrementally. You know, every time a building is sold, you have to improve its performance and so on. We have the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, which is a framework of measures promoting energy efficiency, which technically, well, has a connotation of machine performance. We have the Eco Design Directive, um, which mandates for the performance of things like HEVAC, heat pumps and air conditioning, and to try and get incremental improvements in the efficiency. And then we have the ozone depletion um, uh, directive. Unfortunately, year on year, our buildings and our houses, even the modern ones, are becoming more challenging. In the old, I mean, the traditional Scottish house, was fairly robust, it might have been very leaky, it might have been, um, um, you know, f fairly sort of solid and with cold bridges and so on, but the roofs didn't blow off. In terms of the domestic development of efficiency in the last couple of decades, in the 1990s, we went to sort of, if you've heard of passive house, so you put more insulation around the building, so it's rather simplistic. Insulation around a building, you stop the airflow through the windows and doors, so you stop the drafts. You get rid of cold bridging in the structures. You put in double glazing, or better windows, and then you put in a machine in the centre of it, and it's got all these stringent targets. So that was, I think, 1990s thinking. Then we got more and more interested in um, the noughties in sustainability. So you got this move to better comfort, better indoor air quality, and so on. 
Now we're beginning to realize that the next generation of housing, we've created problems because, for instance, in modern, lightweight, cheap to build, timber, um, highly insulated, um, with very little air movement, you're getting very bad indoor air quality problems and big windows that you can't actually open bits of, and the solution is a small machine. We're getting chronic problems now of overheating in Scotland, and Tim Sharp at Glasgow has done a lot of work on that, which means that eventually we'll be moving more and more to air conditioning Scottish homes at a cost, but we know already that many people in Scotland can't um, afford to heat their homes in winter and won't be able to afford to cool their homes in summer. So we have a real problem, and I think we have to, when we have this thing about um, engaging process of stakeholders, when we develop our action plans after Sullivan, we engage stakeholders. Who do we engage? Houses, for, Homes for Scotland, the Scottish Property Federation, um, Construction Scotland, and down the line, the Buildings and Standards Division. We engage those people who make profits by building lighter, cheaper housing for citizens um, with much higher profits. So I think if you really genuinely want to create a resilient and robust future for the domestic sector with actual um, genuine large emission reductions, you have to start naturally ventilating them again, opening the window, getting rid of those machines, um, and you have to start running them on solar energy. We could um, reduce with a bit of storage and um, solar hot water, solar PV, plus storage. We could reduce from that 30% of emissions. We could reduce them by 15% tomorrow. We could make significant reductions. But we're not going to do it by tinkering as the lobbyist-driven vested interests of Europe and elsewhere through the legislation process, tinkering about getting one or two percent improvement in the heat pumps we put in buildings. Thank you. I think there's two points I want to make in, in answer to Kate Forbes' question. And the first one is about um, what the CCC said about sectors, I think is a really important guide in terms of answering your question. So as Richard said, the sectors where we've done well are electricity and waste. Um, electricity is a sector I'm more familiar with and you can trace quite directly what were the policies that have driven um, the excellent progress that Scotland's made in terms of deploying uh, renewable electricity. It's, um, it's the, obviously the, the decisions about the market and the, the support for the renewables industry is set at the UK level, so there's the UK government role there, but I think everyone involved in the renewable electricity industry really recognises that the leadership that the Scottish <coughs> government showed in setting the 100% target that set out a long, uh, a long term direction out to 2020 in terms of what was going to happen in the renewable electricity industry. And that, that drove a lot of progress. That, that is why Scotland has, has done more on renewable electricity than, than other parts of the UK. Um, but on the flip side, I think if you look at the sectors where the CCC were very clear that we haven't done so well, so um, they particularly talked about transport, um, heat, homes, um, and the land use sectors. It, if you look to the transport sector, for example, if you look to the last climate action plan, um, there are no domestic policies in there. All the policies that are driving um, our transport emission changes are, were EU policies or um, policies at, at the UK level. That there wasn't any Scottish level policy. So I think you know, that, that goes some way to, to answering your question. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is in terms of if you look at how good our last climate action plan was, so known formally as the RPP2, I think one of the criticisms that, that was strongly made of the RPP2 was that it, it was sort of in, insufficiently both transparent and also insufficient in terms of what the monitoring and evaluation process was going to be. So it's unless you know a particular area very well, it's very hard to go back to the last climate action plan and work out what happened, did the things the government say were going to deliver emissions, did those things happen, did they deliver the emissions reductions that had been envisaged. Um, so I think that that's, that's hugely important in terms of looking ahead to the new climate action plan um, that's going to come through. That's, they're, they're two clear things where we need to see um, an RPP deliver much better, the climate action plan deliver much better. First of all, that transparency, that monitorability, if that's a word, um, and also then very clear steer from the Climate Change Committee that we need to step up our actions in those sectors uh, where we've done less well. Um, 
to end on a, on a good news note, um, and uh, this is particularly important, obviously, for all the politicians around the ta table, is that um, we had a survey out, out today which showed that increased action on climate change is something that's very popular with the public. There's only 10% of the Scottish public in our survey um, saying that we shouldn't increase investment in tackling climate change. So the, we should do more, but the good news is that it will be both popular, but also bring lots of benefits in terms of uh, improvements to the economy and the society. OK, very um, briefly from me. I mean, it, all sectors um, have some level of competency at the EU level, at the UK level, and at Scottish level. So it's often very difficult to tease out and say, what is the bit that is only Scotland? Because some of it is enabling to support other parts of legislation that is coming through from UK or EU level. Um, I think the point that was made last week by the Committee on Climate Change, that even with temporary adjust adjustment and backloading, we would still have met our target. Um, and to echo uh, both um, Robin and Richard's point, that we ought to congratulate, us, congratulate ourselves when we have met targets. Clearly, it's focused on two sectors. And then the challenge, I think, for this committee going forward is how do we start to um, really focus on those other sectors where more can be done locally, transport, agriculture, um, domestic housing, as Sue has said, um, uh, and, and energy efficiency more generally. Those are the issues, if you like, which is the forward look that the, I think the committee needs to focus on. Um, <clears throat> I'll limit myself to transport. Uh, I'll concur with pretty much everything that's been said so far about transport. Um, I don't think that Scotland is doing well in terms of uh, transport and climate change. Uh, two specific points. <clears throat> the government's own carbon account shows that the, uh, the large new transport infrastructure investments that the government is engaged, or Transport Scotland are engaged with, they increase the amount of car travel and therefore increase distances and therefore increase uh, um, climate emissions. I would also point to land use planning. Um, the bulk of our land use planning decisions are leading to the creation of car dependent communities uh, which also are relatively far from where people want to go so that also increases distances and increases the use of use of cars and therefore makes it more difficult to hit our climate change targets so I think um, we can have more detailed discussions about that if members have other questions but those are my two main points Okay, that's great. That, that's going to set the scene. So we want to move on and begin to focus on specific areas. So let's start with uh, the energy sector. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Good morning to you all. Uh, there's been, already been this morning some focus on um, energy and Scotland's progress in cutting emissions from the energy sector to date. Uh, if there are further comments about that, um, those would be welcomed uh, from any of the panel and also suggestions of areas or policies that could be prioritised to build on the progress in this sector? Happy to come in on that first. I think the first thing to say is that um, it's only really in the electricity sector where we've made lots of progress. And um, electricity only accounts for about a quarter of our energy usage. Um, heat is half of our energy use. Um, transport's a quarter of our energy use again. So it's even just within the energy sector, it's only quite a small part of our emissions where we've made, made good progress. But I think, again, ec echoing my earlier points, I think we can learn a lot from what we did in electricity. We can transfer that leadership, that direction that, that we had in those sectors uh, into the other sectors. So again, the, the kind of the target setting is important. That's driven a lot of the progress, a lot of the benefits that we've seen from the electricity sector. Um, so WWF is very keen on the idea that um, the Scottish Government in their forthcoming energy strategy, which they're producing alongside the Climate Action Plan, that we set a target for our renewables usage in 2030. Um, so we think the, the target for that that is consistent with our climate, act, our climate Act is that we need to have half of all of our energy usage across all three of those areas, across uh, electricity, heat and transport, half of all that energy usage need to come, needs to come from renewables. Thank you. Uh, just if, it, if it's not putting people on overload, um, uh, could I just ask a couple of supplementary questions that you might feel it's appropriate to answer at this stage, but we could come back to, uh, because they do fit into the whole picture of energy, um, and particularly in relation to the practicality of achieving the significant increase in the installation rate of renewable energy schemes uh, that is required to meet the 2020 renewables targets, and uh, also views on how progress 
can be made um, in uh, district renewable, renewable heating. And Lord Deben last week said that, well, as we all know, this has been slow and that uh, it wasn't necessarily the Scottish culture to be collective. He didn't put it quite like that, but um, I think there is an issue around that, perhaps. So if, if within your remarks, you feel able to, um, to uh, address those issues as well, that would be helpful. Just, yeah. I would just add only one more point on your question around um, the, the district heating and renewable heat side of things. Um, the, there's a, a report from an expert group that looked at reg the role of regulation in um, district heating. It was an expert group set up by the Scottish Government to advise on them. Um, certainly WIF thinks the next step in terms of taking that forward is through uh, the Warm Homes Bill that has been that's within the programme for government. Um, and we'd like to see that Warm Homes Bill deliver a, the kind of regulatory framework that's really very much needed to deliver the extra, the scale up that's required in terms of the scale of district heating schemes and renewable heat that we need in Scotland. We think that we need to get to about 40% um, renewable heat by 2030 to be meeting our climate change targets. It's a really long way to go. Uh, before I let Andy Kerrin, Jenny Goldruth, I think, wants to come in there. Just as a kind of supplementary to what uh, Claudia has mentioned, um, there is a debate, obviously, as to how best that will be uh, achieved in terms of uh, increasing how we deliver renewable heat. Um, and as Claudia said, the CC report um, notes the uptake has been slow and we're looking at how that can be developed in terms of stronger implementation. So does the panel have a view on how we do increase that renewable heat um, in terms of does it come from central government, or local authorities, private industry? Is it a collective view on how best we achieve that? Um, I know in my own constituency, for example, uh, we've got the RWE plant in Mark Inch, the biomass plant, which was supported by £8 million of Scottish government funding. But we also have the council involved in that process um, and a private, obviously, um, company. So I just wonder if there's a collective view on how best that could be achieved. Andy Kerr. OK, just to start, um, Claudia, with your um, question, what we have seen over the last probably 18 months or so since we've, we've seen the renewable electricity subsidies um, come offline has been a genuine attempt to try and move away from just sowing turbines across the landscape and actually say, how can we deliver affordable energy, clean energy at local scale within Scotland? Because we actually already are moving away from the old style of electricity system with big power stations and, and so on and so forth. Um, and there has been a lot of stakeholder engagement and a lot of exploring. One of the challenges we have is that we've seen radical changes in technology costs, we've seen radical changes in energy markets and governance, um, and, so, and, and also actually big changes in how people understand how people use energy within their homes and businesses. So it is actually quite a challenging space to be operating in, and, and obviously a government doesn't want to be in a position to try and choose winners. So what we are seeing is an awful lot of demonstration projects at local energy, at local community level, um, local energy challenge fund, the, the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme, Pathfinder funds, and so on and so forth, uh, and some of the CARES funding, which are about actually just trying things out and exploring what, what works and what doesn't. So I think that actually, a lot of the knowledge behind that will start to come out in the consultation around the Climate Change Plan, RPP3. Uh, and I think this is a really good way for Scotland to go because it actually sets us up to focus far more on people's needs rather than simply how many turbines we have, but actually are we delivering affordable clean energy uh, across the piece. It also actually provides an enormous export opportunity because lots of countries are trying and grappling with this problem and we actually have the skill sets in the private sector, the public sector, the academics to help deliver on that. So I think there is uh, a real opportunity there. In terms of the heat thing specifically, um, we've already picked up um, the, the Warm Homes Bill. I think the other one is um, the government committed to consulting on the minimum standards of energy performance of private sector housing. There's a really important element of that. Um, and also, I think, more, more widely, having the energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority is absolutely key going forward because we ought to be committing public money, but actually as a means to leverage private money, to come back to your question, Public, public sector governments cannot pay for this. This is going to be a huge programme of, of, of investment across the piece in every building in the country. Um, and that cannot be done by the public sector alone. That has to be, how do we use um, smart ways of levering in, leveraging in private money? And you might do that by helping to underwrite risks. You might do that by offering 
interest-free loans. You might do that, you know, and, and, and essentially crowdfunding in private sector funds. There are actually some really interesting business models coming through, which the Scottish Futures Trust and others have been developing, um, to actually bring in private money into these spaces. Um, and I think that's really where the, the focus of the attention needs to be going forward. Okay, thank you. Richard Dixon. On Claudia's two questions, on installation, um, as Andy has mentioned, it's great news that this is now a national infrastructure priority, which focuses minds on long-term investment and a, a bigger scale of investment. My view is that we know what to do, and we've been doing it for some years. We have some very, very good examples of schemes that really work, do the right kind of measures at the right kind of scale in communities but we need to roll that out on a much bigger scale across Scotland. So we know what to do, we just need to find the ways, as Andy suggests, to get private money in as well, so that we can do it at the right scale. On district heating, there are some really interesting conversations going on. So I was part of a conversation about district heating networks in central Glasgow, where you've got universities talking to the council, talking to health providers about the heat they produce and how they might be able to join that up. But if you question them in detail, the answer is always, well, we might be building something with lots of heat, but we can't guarantee that customer will still be there at some point in the future. And so the problem is there's no regulation, as there is in electricity, of the heat market. So that's an urgent priority, is to create, create a regulatory framework, which means if you are a supplier of heat, you're able to guarantee that you'll be able to sell that somehow uh, and not rely on some company next door not going bust next week. So that's really important. That's so important that perhaps we should be thinking of putting that in the climate bill because that, that's one of our first opportunities to put in place a system that would make that work. And that would really open the doors to delivering on all these interesting conversations. And then very finally on Jenny's question about renewable heating, the uh, Committee on Climate Change are very keen on the idea of air source heat pumps for people's domestic properties. And... There are a number of ways you might encourage that. So for new build, we could simply rewrite planning uh, building regulations to mean that new build have to go in that direction in almost all cases. Uh, we have, of course, had boiler scrappages schemes in the past where people uh, with a very old boiler are able to get a bit of a grant to replace it with something much more efficient. That was gas boilers, but we could be doing the same if you're replacing a gas boiler. We could be encouraging people with a bit of money to replace that with something that's renewable heat. So there are regulatory routes and also incentive routes which would encourage and accelerate the transition to renewable heat from simply having a gas boiler. And of course electric heating, as renewables build up and electricity is lower and lower carbon content, electric heating makes more and more sense as well. Uh, so all those options need to be put together in the right kind of bundle to take us in that direction. Okay, I, I want to let Mark Ruskell come in on that. Just on, on the back of that, I was interested to hear what Tom was saying earlier on about the planning system and ensuring that we're designing low-carbon places. Does that feed into the, the discussions around district heating as well, particularly if we're looking at providing certainty for the private sector and public sector to meet opportunities going forward? And how would you, how would you envisage that working within a, a sort of warm homes bill or a... Yeah, so I start off, I think Robin might come in as well, but um, one of the... One of the things that depresses me that I see is big developments going in. So you're, you've got a, an empty site, big development goes in, they've got a boiler in to make their heat, they may even have a CHP to make some of their electricity, but it's not connected anywhere. And that's the stage when you've got an empty site, that's the stage when you can link things up. When you've got a new housing estate being built, that's the cheap time to put pipes in to have district heating. If you want to do it as a retrofit, You've got major disturbance of people's lives. You're digging up roads that have been carefully laid. And so that's much harder and much more expensive. So it, it is almost a crime that we continue to build housing estates that don't have district heating built in from the start because that is the cheap and easy time to do it. So that's, that's planning, the planning system building regulations are absolutely key in helping us do much more sensible things like that. OK, Sue Rolf and then Andy Kerr. Um... I think the theory and the practice here sort of diverges rather because um, if you take somebody who's building a new big housing scheme, for instance, uh, out in the border somewhere, um, they cannot guarantee, and this is like remote transport communities too, they're going to put in 800 houses because they know they're going to make shed loads of money out of it. 
um, they cannot guarantee that once they've built the first hundred, the second hundred will come and the third hundred. So do you front end load the cost of these schemes on those first hundred houses? No, they don't because they couldn't sell the houses. So, I mean, in theory, it's a nice idea, but who's going to pay for it and how they're going to pay for it? And putting the, um, the actual systems at the cost of the Scottish voter, um, I don't know, necessarily think is a very good um, use of Scottish money. Um, the other thing about technology tie-ins, air source heat pumps, well, they technically work well with 1.4, 1.3 COPs in practice. They can be terrible, and we've got lots and lots of failed uh, heat pump systems. So to mandate that everybody has to have a, an air source heat pump in, I think, is is um, possibly not doing many people a great deal of favour. But the other thing is that people, myself included, can actually build houses or design houses that don't need much heat anymore. I mean, that's the solution, and one of the ways of doing that is to incorporate within the buildings themselves, as we always used to say in the cavity wall, is actual thermal storage within the house itself. So you put a, you know, an inner lining of concrete block walls, and that absorbs the heat during the day so you can reuse it. With lightweight, highly insulated buildings, as soon as the doors open and there's the sun's gone down, there's no renewable heat left in the system. And yet we're 87, 88% lightweight timber frame buildings with um, no thermal storage within them. So I think that, that probably you'd be doing the, um, the actual citizens of Scotland more of a favour if you actually mandated for some thermal storage to provide some resilient heat over time than trying to force them to, to put in extremely expensive and often inefficient and expensive to run heat pump systems. But I will just, my last point is that there is only one way of taking an individual person out of fuel poverty, and this is across the board, and that's to put the solar panels on their own roof. And this is why I think that the best thing you can do, this huge surge towards installation of solar energy, 10,000 they were going to do in Glasgow housing sites, it's to take Households at the same time as you're investing in distributed energy capacity, you're taking every one of those individual homes out of fuel poverty forever. And surely, if we can do both of those, we're meeting two targets which are difficult to achieve anyway. But, but don't we, we have to have a cultural change in the housing sector in, in terms of the developers who will always find a reason not to do things? And that's the mindset, isn't it? And we need to get to the point where they understand their responsibilities here and contribute to what we're all trying to achieve. We have little nudgy uh, regulations like all houses must have, you know, adequate natural ventilation opportunities because the lights will increasingly go out. We know we live in an unstable energy system. Um, they must have enough thermal mass capacity to stabilise in thermal temperatures and they should avoid overheating due to simply the orientation. You face your house west, you might, in the last two weeks, I don't know how many of you have been severely uncomfortable in your own homes, yeah? Um, simply by just correct orientation. So simple planning laws saying, optimizing the solar benefits and negating the solar disbenefits of construction. It doesn't cost anything to change the orientation of a house. That's interesting. Andy Keogh. Yeah, just to come back in terms of what you, uh, to Mark, in terms of what you might put in the Warm Homes Bill, I think one of the key things to remember, of course, is that, is that heat is inherently local. So what works, you know, off gas grid in the rural environment um, for 15% of the homes and businesses across the country, um, you know, where they're often going to be using either oil or electricity for heating is going to be a very different solution to a suburban settlement or very different from the tenements in the centre of our cities. So one or two of them might suit district heating, suburban settlements don't because the sheer capital cost of putting the pipes in just don't pay back any time soon. Um, so it's actually just uh, making sure that there's very clear zoning, which comes back to the planning system, about where it is appropriate for 
um, if you like, heat regulations that Richard mentioned, heat laws, which say if you're in this type of space, then it is appropriate to do this, but also to be very aware that it won't, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, I think it's worth also just flagging, you know, the big challenge for heat is that heat energy demand is something like four times as much heat energy demand in December as it is in June. So it is much, much more variable seasonally and daily than electricity is. And so the issue is always, if you're going to meet the, the, the maximum heat demand, you're going to have a lot of redundancy in the system because for a lot of the year it's not on. And so again, in terms of affordability for businesses and for homes, a lot of the issue is not just can we generate more, but can we actually make them more efficient in the first place so you don't have this peaking demand, which then you can do it through business models, you can do it through, you know, National Grid do it, you can do it through lots of different ways to try and get off these peaking demand, peak, this peak demand level. But that is the big challenge that we face in, in, in heat. And at UK level, there was a narrative for many years which said all we need to do is electrify the whole system. They've come away from that, fortunately, now. Um, the next big one that's coming through is, well, we'll just stick hydrogen in the gas pipes. Now, that might work, but actually understanding the cost behind it. And, and the reason for doing that is that we've already got the pipes in the ground. So you don't then need to build a huge amount of infrastructure for, for houses. We don't really know what the costs of that are, but you will hear more and more people pushing that as the silver bullet. And we just need to be aware that that is one option, but we have to be careful of, of understanding the wider costs and benefits. OK, thank you for that. I've got a lot of members wanting to make a contribution and witnesses. To, um, can I remind people we've got a lot of ground to cover so we keep the contributions short and sharp? Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to seek the panel's views on whether they see there's a role for fracking in Scotland uh, as a bridging fuel and the compatibility of fracking with Scotland's um, greenhouse gas targets, and indeed whether there are any wider comments on the challenges of the energy shift from fossil fuels. Before we respond to that, can I also raise the issue of carbon capture and storage? Because last week, Lord Deben made the point that the UK CCC had told the UK Parliament that CCS must be addressed urgently. So I'd welcome your views on how pivotal CCS is. Who wants to go? Richard Dixon. Um, on fracking, obviously the UK Committee on Climate Change have done a report on the UK picture on the compatibility of fracking with climate targets. And the industry said it said it's OK as long as you regulate it nicely. Uh, the committee said, well, there are some very tough regulatory tests to meet and then it might be OK. So there are different views on the same report. The same committee, of course, are doing a report for Scotland on what it would mean for our climate targets, and our climate targets are much tighter, of course. So if they said very cautiously it might perhaps be OK for the UK, then it's quite hard to see how they're going to say it's going to be at all OK for Scotland, because every climate change emission that you produced from fracked gas you would have to compensate for somewhere else in the Scottish economy, and that's pretty hard to do. Um, fracking itself, it's not clear that there's really ever going to be a viable industry, despite the claims of INEOS, who are terribly bullish, but Quadrilla, who've been doing this for a lot longer and who are accessing a much bigger potential resource in the north of England, have said that it would take them five years and 40 boreholes just to work out if there's a viable industry that's worth economically tapping into at all. So if there's any, there may not be much and it may be quite a long way away. At the same time in Scotland, we're rapidly becoming more energy efficient and moving towards renewables. And in terms of our electricity supply, we've closed down our coal-fired station, so the only fossil fuel station left is uh, the Peterhead gas station, which is running on reduced capacity. So we're doing very well at moving away from fossil fuels in the electricity sector, and that's the trend we should continue rather than go backwards, introduce some fracked gas, which we then have to build a new power station to burn. In terms of CCS, um, a few years ago, this looked like perhaps an attractive option. These days, again, in the Scottish context, why would we want it? Because we would only need it if we were building new fossil fuel stations instead of continuing on the track for renewables. And it might be an important technology in some other places, but even if you look at the places we used to think it was going to be important, like China, China does burn lots of coal, but actually they're looking at how to reduce that. They're pulling down coal-fired power stations around Beijing. They're the biggest installer of solar and wind in the world. So they are moving away from the need for CCS. So although 
Scotland has lots of engineering expertise and access to the North Sea, which would be useful if CCS was a thing worth doing. It doesn't seem that it should be a thing worth doing. If we're going to spend research money on something in Scotland, we should be making wave power work. We should be making floating offshore work for wind power. We shouldn't be spending it on CCS. Yeah. Robin Parker. Two quick points. Just firstly on fracking, um, I think the global message is very clear that we start. We need to start leaving fossil fuels in the ground if we're going to tackle climate change. Scotland's always played a leadership role, and here's a way in which, and building on all the points that Richard said, is a way that we can we can play that leadership role. On CCS, um, WWF's always supported it, like you know, no harm in researching it, sort of thing. I think our concern has often been that um, we're planning for it. So our current Scotland's current electricity generation policy statement assumes that we will have some um, new gas power plant fitted with CCS. I think partly that's no longer a reflection of the, the kind of commercial realities, partly you know, result the, the unfortunate decision to reduce, to remove that, that financial support for the research element. But always it was kind of you know, why, when this may or may not come through to commercialization, are we planning that this will be here? Uh, the good news on that is that WWF commissioned a piece of research a little while ago um, called Pathways to Power that looked at what kind of electricity system we could have in Scotland in 2030, and that showed that we could have an almost entirely renewable electricity system, it's like almost, almost almost entirely kind of thing, um, and that would provide us both with a safe and secure um, energy energy electricity system, but also would maintain our exporting position so we would continue to export um, to England and other parts of the the. Uh, Great Britain grid. Yeah, Andy Kerr. Um, so I, I, I always find um, Richard Robbins' answers on, on fracking slightly disingenuous. 80% um, of our homes use gas for heating and will do for the next 10, 20, 25 years. Um, this week, the first big tanker load of fracked gas is going to arrive in Scotland for, our, for INEOS. Um, we are using it already. So the question is not, should we use it or should we frack it? The question is, will it still allow us to meet our climate targets? And they're kind of fuel neutral they don't care what you do as long as you meet those carbon targets um, so i'm i'm actually pretty ambivalent about fracking as long as it is done in an environmentally sensitive way and it's not clear it can be but if it can be then that's fine um, the issue is more um, can we ensure that we are delivering on the quality of the housing, the demand reduction from housing? Can we improve the housing stock, et cetera, et cetera, so that actually gas is, is irrelevant, whether it's fracked or not fracked, uh, in 25 years' time? That's actually the heart of what we're trying to do on the climate target. So uh, to me, to me it, I'm, I'm, it's always a slightly odd debate to say, should you frack because of climate change? We're using gas already. The question is, you know, the gas is either going to come from Russia or it's going to be fracked gas from the US, which we're using in Scotland. Um, does it matter whether we've fracked it ourselves? Not really, I don't think. But I think the point no. is, is where, do, where can we have a technological advantage? And the places where we can have, there's a, there's a company over near Glasgow who produce heat pumps. There's a place in Norway where they've got a heat pump running a district heating scheme. So I think as, as we should kind in, of yeah, back no, no. our winners. As an, industrial, as an industrial strategy, I absolutely agree. We've got far more expensive gas than the US have. Yeah, and, and that's fine. But to say let's then stop businesses trying it, seems slightly odd to me. It's like, well, if they want to put money into that, that's fine, as long as they are clear that they won't be using gas in homes in 20 years, 25 years' time. Um, so just on the CCS, sorry, can I just say on the CCS thing, absolutely agree that CCS is irrelevant in Scotland on the power sector. Where it's not is in some of the industry. So if you're talking about Grangemouth, if you're talking about some of the big um, industrial sites, having small CCS on those is potentially a sensible way of doing it. And again, it's, it's a question of should you shut it down? No, it's not the same big deal as it is in the UK, but it doesn't mean it's absolutely irrelevant in Scotland. OK, thank you. Sue Rolf. Um, thank you very much. I mean, the problem of energy is, is twofold. Is One is, how much is there? Is it enough to meet our needs? And the second is, what's the personality of its, uh, the, the relationship between its demand and supply? So it's the peakiness of the demand in relation to the supply. I don't know how many of you have looked out of your window and see what I call the great eye of Sauron over the last weeks, that huge gas flame um, throbbing on the um, horizon. C can you see that one? It's sort of, they're flaring off, and they have been for 10 days, millions and millions of tonnes of gas. You know, it really does look like Mordor over there. But um, which raises the issue of storage. You know, um, 
Um, surely storage is pertinent to this entire um, debate. And if we're to, because we are using, we can use with judicious management less and less energy each year. So why would we want to introduce new and um, potentially environmentally expensive technologies when we don't need them? We can meet them with our growing renewable capacity. But this issue of storage is critical. And I think that off-river double-pumped systems, hydro storage, battery storage, et cetera, et cetera, really has to be introduced into this debate at this point. But the issue that Andy's raised, which is one is not the third element of the energy thing, is the quality of energy. It's what they call low exergy energy systems. So some, for some functions, you need really strong, high, high quality energy, like the industrial sector where you need, for instance, um, maybe um, a currently gas, gas turbines and, or coal-fired turbines, in which case um, the idea of a low exergy system is you actually use, you provide the types of energy you need in the different, energies you, uh, different energy qualities you need. So where you've got Grangemouth and a big industrial complex, it may be that for the next 10, 20 years you need that coal-fired capacity to actually get the quality of energy you need for industry, in which case CCS has got to be a, a no-brainer on that one. Um, but I, just to raise that point about storage, okay, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to uh, transport now, Dave. Uh, can I move on to the transport debates that Convener has um, uh, mentioned? Uh, panelists will know that 28% of our emissions are because of transport, and I think Tom highlighted some issues about transport um, earlier on. What are the panel's views on, and how satisfied are the panel, about Scotland's attempts to reduce emissions from transport? Tom, could start with you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think I, I alluded to my views earlier on that at the Scottish level, the, the policies that have been implemented um, or perhaps not implemented are uh, leading to increases in, in climate change emissions from, from transport, not, not the reverse. Um, I'm concerned about the investments in new infrastructure, which because they reduce the time cost of travel by car, then they make car travel effectively cheaper. And if you make something cheaper, then people consume more of it. So they'll travel longer distances, which generates more, more emissions. Um, so the, the question is, what, what could Scotland do? Because so many of the uh, aspects of, of transport policy that are related to climate change are, are devolved. Um, Something that comes up frequently is where we should invest more in public transport and bring about modal shift to public transport. And uh, I'm absolutely not averse to that, but uh, I would caution the, um, the amount of change that can be brought about, especially in the short to medium term through investment in public transport. If we think there's around about 15 million trips a day made in Scotland uh, by everybody living in Scotland, around about three per day per person, nine to 10 million trips of those by car, one and a half million by public transport at the moment. So if you were to double the number made by public transport, you would only make a, a relatively modest dent in the amount of travel by car. But also, how would you actually bring about a doubling of the number of people using public transport, particularly if you were trying to get them all to be people who came previously from car? It would be, um, it, would <clears throat> it would need immense investment in public transport. And that's something that, as we know, looking at the schemes that are underway at the moment, um, doesn't happen quickly nor cheaply, although I have done quite a lot of research that suggests it can be delivered more cheaply in other European countries. And I think maybe that would be something that could be looked at with regard to district heating costs as well. But that aside, you know, also don't expect that if you do invest in public transport that everybody who uses, that all the new users of public transport will automatically come from car, of course not. If you want to bring about mode shift from car, you need improvements to the alternative to car, as well as some disincentives to the use of car. Road pricing, I know it's not politically um, uh, very acceptable, road pricing and parking charging, for, for example. The, the cities that have brought, around, brought about mode shift from car to public transport have implemented those types of measures. Um, we mustn't also forget the contribution of vans and HGVs to, to climate change emissions. And there are perhaps steps that, the Scot that Scotland um, could, could take to change the characteristics of the technologies that are used um, for vans and HGVs. 
if I can, should I continue or would, would so I, I just want, if, if I may just just to make the point um, you, your contribution perhaps doesn't touch upon the, the issue of the wrong type of vehicles on the roads mm. and that electric vehicles for example yeah, yeah. would have a contribution to make and interestingly I think there's a stat out today that says only one percent of the vehicles purchased in Scotland in the mm. last month I think it was uh, were electric vehicles yeah. compared to Norway where it was 33 yeah. percent so yeah. we seem to have a so we could have better vehicles yeah. on the road, but yeah. we seem to be reluctant to, to, to buy them. Yeah, well, <clears throat> clearly, if in the medium term, short to medium term, the, the, a high percentage of trips are continue to be made by vehicles on the road, then we need to address the technology of those vehicles, the, the engine technology. Um, how can we do that? My understanding of the Norwegian situation, which does have a very, very high, well, the highest in the world share of, uh, of electric vehicles, is that um, both in terms of charging points and fast charging points, but more importantly, the price of those vehicles. So incentives and disincentives to encourage people to buy electric vehicles. So that's making electric vehicles cheaper, but also through, through taxation, making highly polluting vehicles much more expensive. And we see, well, it was evidence presented in the CCC report in the, in the Netherlands, their vehicle excise duty um, uh, structure has led to um, a much faster adoption of lower emitting vehicles than we see in the UK. But of course, vehicle excise duty is currently a, 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 a reserved matter. Okay. The other thing that I might draw the panel, the, the, the committee's attention to, in terms of what you could do to encourage the uptake, the further uptake of, of low emission, emission vehicles, and this is something that w is within local authority powers in, in Scotland under the 2001 Transport Act. Um, if we look at where low emission vehicles have been bought in Britain, if we control so for socioeconomic factors, income, so on, um, leave that out of the equation, we find that people who live in a London borough are sometimes something like eight times more likely to own a low emission vehicle than people elsewhere in Britain. And we can only conclude that a main contributory factor there is the fact that they live close to a road user charging scheme. Yeah. Um, in central London, and they get a discount or free uh, entry. I was actually okay. just going to say that, that then it appears to me what you're saying is that modal shift is a combination um, of carrot and stick, uh, but also a bit of psychology as well. And mm. I was saying to the chair of the Climate Change Committee last week when I, when I stayed in London when congestion charge came in, I mean, overnight, I can see a difference. I was in a very urban yeah. area. The difference in road flow, because people then were penalised for taking the car in. But the other side of the coin was there was a huge investment from that apothecation into new buses and new tubes. So there was a greater capacity, greater ability yeah. to travel by public, by public transport. So is your point then that we need to look at carrot stick, but also look at the psychology of making that jump? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I would say so. Although, in the, in the case of the London congestion charging scheme, um, I think it's interesting that people in outer London boroughs have also acquired um, a low emission vehicles at a faster rate than the population of Britain as a whole, even though one would expect that they probably don't drive into central London very often at all, but that still had an impact on their, their, their purchase choice. Um, but yes, a, a combination of carrot and stick. Um, but bear in mind in the London scheme also, the London congestion charging scheme, there was not actually great investment at the time of the implementation of the scheme in new rail or new underground. That was something that was just kind of ongoing and that reflects the length of delivery time. There was an improvement in the bus service. Yeah. Hmm. Can I ask part of the issue, sorry. Um, I was just when we were talking about electric vehicles that are hard back to the last parliament. Um, uh, can I ask panel members when you're answering these questions to, to think at another angle on this. The UK CCC has identified the possibility of reducing the upper speed limit from 70 to 60 miles an hour and they talk about an 8% drop in emissions as a result. That's quite a substantial contribution but I wonder how popular that would be with the public. So can we explore that as a, as a possible option as well alongside what Dave's developed? Just to dig off the other side of the coin, uh, yeah, convener, you'll know that in the A9 in my day in the Highlands Islands that there is a government trial to increase HGV speed, which I had a small contribution in, uh, from 40 to 50. Now that may seem counterintuitive to be increasing speed, um, but the Haulage Association tell me that if you're driving at 50 in top gear, you actually are less emitting than 40 in a lower gear. And as you'll know, England and Wales have already introduced 50 mile an hour speed uh, for single carriageway. So we've got the irony that if you're going from England to Scotland in a single carriageway in the HGV, you have to drop speed from 50 to 40. So I would welcome the panel's view on both issues, which are dropping speed limits 
for general transport and increasing from 40 to 50 for HGVs in Scotland. Robin Parker and then Richard. I want to make a, a few points. I think the first one is in answer to Dave Stewart's first question about our overall progress in transport. So far, I think the statistics speak for themselves. We're more or less barely shifted from our 1990 levels in terms of climate change emissions from the transport sector. So it's, it's one of the ones where we, we really need to find solutions. And as I mentioned earlier, there aren't solutions in the existing climate plan. But I think this, I really, you know, I really hope government is listening to this conversation because the one thing that is so apparent from this discussion is there's any number of answers, there's any number of solutions that are around there or that exist. We just need to go out there, take these solutions and decide which ones are the right ones for Scotland and which ones to implement. Um, you, know, you can draw so many from elsewhere in the world. There's the, in, in Norway, there's, in addition to things that Tom Rice mentioned, there's plenty of things that the government have done in terms of um, you know, priority, priority me measures for electric, electric vehicles. Um, mention of London, um, I go back, I grew up in London, you go back, the scale of cycling that is, is now there in comparison and infrastructure has been a big part of driving that. And um, the other point I wanted to make was around behaviour changes. It, behaviour change doesn't sort of happen in a vacuum, it happens in response to all of those different uh, carrots and sticks or nudges and different things that, that, that governments can do that, at, at all levels that make and drive those, those behaviour changes. So. The last thing I want to say is that there's a huge number of benefits that come from um, the changes we could make in the transport sector as well, like the things to do with, with air quality, the things to do with health, the things to do with just the livability and desirability of our cities. Another example we could look to is Nottingham. They've put in place a, a work-based parking levy. Um, and one of the changes that has brought about is it's made it much more um, good place for business to do business. So it's brought new companies into that because there's really good public transport systems, makes it a much more uh, livable city. Um, and then the last thing on speed limits is that that's an area where powers are coming to this parliament. So I think we should look through future legislation, how we can use those powers. I think the other, the other one to mention is very much about 20 mile per hour speed, speed as, as the standard speed limit in cities. And that really changes the livability, also makes it much easier for um, local authorities to implement that because that's the standard. And then you decide where you need a higher speed limit rather than the other way around. And that reduces signage costs and so on. Richard Dixon. Um, I think there's uh, some hope for optimism about the next climate change plan and the amount of action we might have proposed in it on transport. Different from the previous two, this one's going to be based on the output of a big computer model of the Scottish economy, the Times model, which I'm sure you'll be hearing lots about in future. Um, so there are good and bad things about that. A good thing is that it looks across all sectors and says, well, this one should do this much. So it's going to produce a number for transport and say transport needs to do a lot because it's done very little so far, as Robin was saying. So there will, there will be much more of a numerical challenge to the people in transport and the transport minister to do more, to come up with policies that do more. So, and that will be much stronger than the previous two exercises. So that's very helpful. I think a, a concern about the Times model, so the Times model is a very sensible thing to apply, but it looks at very direct costs and carbon savings. And we know from previous work in transport that if you look, for instance, at investment in cycle infrastructure, that looks expensive for the amount of carbon you save. If you look more widely at the fact that more people will cycle and they will be healthier and they will have less days off sick at work so the economy will be better and you'll have less bills in the NHS because they're less sick because they're fitter, then even just in economic terms, that carbon saving looks much better. So we need to understand whether Times is taking into account those very important secondary benefits, which are both good for the economy and also good for the people of Scotland. So we need to understand that. In terms of your question, just to finish off on your question about speed limits, um, we've, also, we've already seen that in the, the long roads where we have average speed cameras, that the fact that people are now obeying the speed limit is saving us some carbon because people are driving at the speed limit instead of five or 10 miles over it on average. So that's been very helpful. And I think there's an important lesson there that when average speed cameras first started to appear, there was a lot of very negative reaction and negative publicity. Now they're routine on some of our major roads and in lots of roadworks, there are average speed cameras. People understand them, they know how to operate with them and they understand that they're about preventing accidents and saving lives. They're also about saving carbon. So I think there's a big lesson in thinking that if you do something challenging in transport, there will be a huge negative reaction that politically it will be far too dangerous. 
actually the lesson of both the average speed cameras and the 20 mile an hour zones in Edinburgh, where there's a lot of nervousness in introducing them, public actually like these things. They understand the rationale. It's about saving lives, it's about saving money, it's about saving carbon. And people actually are mature enough to get that. And so the, there's a small bit of the roads lobby which will go off the deep end about it, but the public will see, actually, yes, that's a good idea. So proposing a 60 mile top speed limit, for instance, is certainly something that we should be considering. Okay, uh, Andy Kerr. Okay, two, two very quick points, um, really just to add to, to some of what Tom has talked about. One is that we are in the midst of a, an emerging revolution in transport services with data analytics and connectivity. So it's what you might call the, the Uber effect, uh, in the sense that a lot of transport providers of goods and services and moving people around are being radically disrupted by uh, incoming technologies. Now, with all disruptive technologies, you're never quite sure which way it's going to go, whether it supports what we're doing or doesn't. But there are ways in which, again, the Parliament can shift things to make sure that as that revolution takes place in Scotland, that we actually start to see some, some real benefits. So if you listen to some of the companies who are coming in with these services, how do we ensure that when they're doing individual mobility, that they're doing it in a way which is low carbon, in other words, providing fleets of electric vehicles to make that sort of thing happen. So there are lots of things that we're seeing that, that you, you will pick up over the next year or two, um, which will be just worth being aware of. The second quick point about speed limits, we did a review of speed limits, not on the higher ones, but from 30 to 20. Um, and the answer was, as, as Robin said, there's loads of livability benefits of bringing speed limits down to 20. It's very marginal as to whether there's much carbon benefit because it all depends on how much start-stop traffic there is and so on and so forth. But actually, overall, for each town and city, it's a benefit to bring it down um, at the sort of 30 to 20. And I think the, the, the um, heavy goods vehicle folk are quite right that actually having more stable speeds at 50 is not unreasonable on a carbon basis rather than um, slowing traffic down. Okay, I've got a lot of people want to come in on this and we need to wrap this up. So, uh, uh, Tom, I'll let you come back on this. Sue and then Mark and Emma want to make a contribution then Dave can finish up. Uh, yeah, I just concur uh, very much with what's been said about the, um, the, the sort of politics of implementing what might be perceived to be unpopular measures in transport. Um, moving on and linking to that, the, the question of how, do you, how might you introduce reduced speed limits on, uh, on higher speed roads. Um, one thing you might start with is just ensuring that the existing speed limit is indeed uh, enforced rather than simply, uh, rather than trying to re reduce the, the, the current speed limit. Um, some some uh, assessment of that was carried out in RPP1. Um, so keeping motorway speeds to 70 miles an hour rather than them being above 70 miles an hour at the moment, and that was uh, predicted to save around 25 kilotons of carbon a year uh, in Scotland. How might you sell then the reduction from the current speed limit to a lower speed limit? I think, obviously, the accident benefits that we, that we see, for example, on the A9, but also the congestion reduction benefits, because when, there, when there's heavy traffic uh, on congested motorways, as, for example, the M8 at peak time between Edinburgh and Glasgow, then running at lower speeds can increase the capacity of the motorway and therefore the reliability of the journey time, which is extremely important, so a benefit to, to users. Um, finally, I would say it's very, very, very important to do all the um, sort of mode shift stuff, uh, the cycling investment, the walking investment, for all the health and livability reasons that we've heard. However, we, we mustn't forget that for cars, the bulk of our CO2 emissions come from medium distance journeys. So. As, as travellers, we make a lot of very short journeys. They don't produce much carbon. The, the carbon is coming from our less frequent medium distance journeys, by which I mean between sort of 20 and 50 miles, if you, if you look at the data this, this demonstrates. So we have to think about well, how do you, what do you do to address those trips that are producing so much of our carbon. And the things to shift people to cycling and walking and certainly bus-based public transport, because those tend to be shorter trips, then they're not necessarily going to have a huge benefit in carbon terms, although they're going to have massive benefits in health terms, in livability terms, in road safety terms, and local air quality terms. They're very important. Uh, so what do you maybe do about that? I'll get back, go back to a point I made right at the beginning. What about land use? What about ensuring that we locate our new developments in areas that are easy to walk and cycle? and take public transport to and from and not stick them right on uh, some form of sprawl on the edge of town or into completely 
isolated new settlements where the only viable choice is car and they're a long way away from where people need to go. Okay, thank so, you, Sue. Thank you. Um, Norway produces 147, 140% of its electricity from clean renewable hydro. Therefore, it's a no-brainer for electric cars. Um, Singapore has recently irked Elon Musk by refusing to allow Teslas into their market because they don't have any renewable energy. And a Tesla is a really big car. So it uses a lot of energy to get from A to B, whether it's electric or not. So this simple uh, message about the size of vehicles must be um, critical too. But also this um, making sure that if we're running vehicles, um, electric vehicles, that they are run on renewable energy, which means pricing tariffs for electricity. Uh, I've got an electric bike, I've got a PV roof and a battery, and you can see exactly when you're charging. And it would seem to me that most electric vehicle charging would be at night. So it's considerable effort if we want to grow the electric vehicle fleets um, has to be put into that relationship between energy supply, charging, and making the vehicles work for us in that larger system. Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks, convener. I think some really interesting comments there about the wider secondary benefits of some of this action. Um, and also in terms of, you know, how do we create communities that have got, you know, strong well-being and, and are genuinely sustainable. I'm interested then in how we capture that within RPP, and we'll come on to talk about RPP a wee bit later on. But, you know, if, for example, we introduce default 20 mile an hour uh, areas for, you know, residential areas in Scotland, it's clearly a benefit in terms of health, in terms of public safety as well. So how does that then read across into the remit of the Cabinet Secretary for Health? And how does it also read across then into planning as well? Because it's important, I think, we capture these sustainability benefits. Um, I just wanted to ask, before we leave transport, a question about air passenger duty as well. Um, air, Lord Devon last week talked about the trade-offs uh, in terms of policy. Um, I mean, clearly there's a, you know, an economic policy the government's got to reduce air passenger duty, but do you see any alternatives to that that would still meet the government's um, overall economic objectives, but would perhaps reflect the true environmental cost of frequent flights? I'm happy to say that. I think it should kind of be a point of principle on air passenger duty that we've got new powers coming to the parliament. We should be using those powers that are consistent with, with our Climate Change Act. Um, so I think the first and foremost thing that the Scottish Government should be doing is trying to find a way that we do use those powers to actually reduce our, our climate change emissions. And it's frustrating that the, the Government knows exactly how much that they've done the analysis of what um, it, it, cutting air passenger duty in half will do to our climate change emissions. Um, and that's, you know, the, why haven't we looked at other, other types of models and modelled what they would do in terms of our climate change emissions? I think the other point I would make on the kind of the economic benefits it's actually not a very good policy in terms of trying to uh, achieve what I understand government to be trying to achieve here, which is that they say that they want to increase um, uh, Scotland's direct connections. But again, that own, their own modelling that they've done of this um, points to half of the passenger increase coming from people flying domestically within the UK. And given that we don't, a, APD isn't charged on flights to the islands and stuff, um, that's basically flights from the central belt to, to, to London. Um, so it, it's not it's not a good policy in terms of trying to achieve what government's trying to achieve. So I think it's definitely a, a place where we should look again and do something different. President, there are, you, you touched on consistency of approach there. Um, you, you guys are members of Stop Climate Chaos. One of your member organisations uh, has taken uh, legal action to block offshore uh, renewable uh, production, which completely undermines the direction of travel we are on. So there's a, a lack of consistency of approach there as well, isn't there? I, th I think the, you know, I can't speak for other organisations who obviously on on the panel. Um, WOF Scotland has always been um, supportive of um, renewables being in the right places, and but also very supportive of um, the, the huge opportunity that Scotland has in terms of all forms of offshore renewables. We couldn't get a quarter of Europe's um, uh, 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 offshore renewable potential is in Scotland. Scotland should be the, the kind of heart of this industry, and there's been a huge amount of really positive change that's come about um, and progress with the developments in um, uh, in Orkney and Shetland with with marine renewables. So, you know, marine renewables is a place where Scotland has a good story to tell, and we can we can lead the way on it. Okay, uh, Tom Rye. Yeah, uh, with regard to air passenger duty. 
Um, I too am rather curious about how this is intended to uh, benefit the Scottish economy. If we look at UK passenger statistics as a whole at uh, airports, then we find that only around about 20% of passengers have, have come in from other countries, so 80% of passengers are British. So this kind of implies that they may be going elsewhere, so taking their money elsewhere. Also, um, when we look at the mean income of leisure travellers, there's around about £53,000 household income for the average leisure traveller from a UK airport. Um, this would indicate the air passenger duty reduction um, is perhaps a, a regressive in terms of it's, a it's going to be a subsidy to, to wealthier people. So uh, on those two counts, I, I find it slightly problematic. Um, also, we have to look in carbon terms at the immense impact of international air travel, um, about 32 million tonnes of carbon, uh, calculated to be produced by UK residents travelling internationally by air, that uh, compares with about 100 million tonnes from surface, uh, surface transport. So um, that it's a very, very significant proportion. What could we do? What could we do about, about it? <laughs> I think the bulk of air travel is being, is being carried out by people who travel frequently by air, um, such as myself, I have to say. Right? Uh, I think <laughs> I, I do and I wouldn't mind paying more for additional journeys. Um, some, some form of duty of that nature it might be difficult to actually um, produce or implement and, and, uh, and enforce, but uh, if, get it, if you could get over those barriers, I think that would have an impact on air travel. Okay. But Andy Kerr, uh, you might be able to answer this question as well. Is it not the case that the projected increase in emissions from APD being halved is equivalent to 0.01 per cent of Scotland's overall emissions? Is that right? That's, um, you're putting me on the spot. I, Sorry. I, <laughs> I would need to go and check that. But it's not, it's not huge. I mean, I think there are two, two things to say, one of which is airline emissions are capped within the European system. Um, so you know, we need to keep that in mind. They won't grow exponentially as they have done in the past. Um, again, I'll come back to a point that, that Richard make, made about the Times modelling. So within the Scottish Government, what they've tried to do is create an analytical framework to allow them to ask awkward questions of ministers. And that will say, if you're prepared to do APD, cut the APD, and therefore there will be a rise in emissions over here, what are you going to do over there to, to compensate for it? And as long as the total you know, territorial emissions are within the carbon target, it doesn't really matter, then it's a, this trade-off between economic policy and others. So I think we do need to be clear that the question to the minister then is, okay, you want to go and do that, what is the thing that you're going to compensate for that particular emissions? What additional thing over and above what you already have? And I think that's the, that's the looking at in the system in the round that is the important point. Okay, thank you. Cost is the best way to do it, you know, an alternative to APD, mm -hmm. which reflects the costs, but... Yeah, no, I, I think there are, and there are different ways. What is interesting is a number of the European countries that have taken it away and sought to try and put in different systems. And I suppose what you could say is why don't we actually look very closely at which ones have worked to deliver both the economic benefits, as Tom has mm. flagged, as well as the environmental benefits. And, and I, I don't know the answer to that. If, if, if you have access to that information, um, if, if you do, it would be useful if you could share it with the committee, perhaps write to us and we could have a look at that. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, Emma Harper. Just a couple of quick points. Um, I was at a bike shop on Friday and his electric bikes are going out the door really, really fast. Um, I'm assuming that's a good thing because we want people on their electric bikes so that uh, they can make their five to ten mile short journeys. But just to be clear that the charging of the bikes overnight that Sue said isn't going to like overcome that, you know, don't we? We need people to be riding their electric bikes rather than their cars. Can I just answer that? Um, I think that there's a sort of a complete mind shift that has to go on so that w why is there any reason why when you get to work in your hospital or your school or something, you haven't got solar all over the, the roof and you can charge it there? Or else, again, this tariff thing. You know, you might get a tariff whereby we've got excess wind at night um, and um, you... you just sort of the tariff, the ch electric bike charging tariff can reflect where we can harvest free energy out of the system. So, um, I, but I think it's a huge growth area, actually. It's, it's a surprising one that's come through. But I think we, that has to be given a bit of thought now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Dave, do you want to wrap this up? So a, ve a very quick uh, final question, because time's against us. Can I just ask the panel about best practice? Um, last session, I went to um, Holland, where I 
was shown around the consolidation centre, which panel members may know are where they take um, HGVs arrive with uh, massive uh, stock for cities and smaller electric vehicles take the stock from the consolidation centres into the city so you're not polluting within city zones, which I think, I think in Stirling has been looked at by our transport companies. Could I ask very quickly, uh, start with Tom, ask the panel's view on this best practice idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, very quickly. Um, I think there's, there's value in understanding um, what certain cities elsewhere in Europe have achieved in terms of their, their changes in, in their transport system, particularly those that have brought about a, a mode shift away from car and a mode shift away from uh, vehicle in truck-based freight through consolidation centres, for example. Um, what I would caution against, I do w work a lot on European projects that share best practice. What I think is absolutely fundamental to understand if one is going to view best practices um, you know, what, what are the processes and what are the underlying legislative frameworks and regulatory frameworks that support that and enable that best practice? Because on, one can often find that, yes, that seems like an amazingly good example of best practice. However, the regulatory, financial, uh, organisational framework in one's own country is so different that actually it's not possible to implement that example of best practice in the same way, unfortunately. Um, I mean... I, I, I worked, lived and worked in Sweden. Um, I directed a public transport research center there. Uh, a great deal is achieved in public transport in Sweden in terms of, for example, uh, alternatively fueled buses. Um, but their regulatory framework is so different that uh, it would make it extremely difficult to replicate that very easily here. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's my caution about best practice. It's great to learn from best practice, mm. but understand how that was done and what the regulatory and organisational framework was that enabled it and mm. see whether or not that framework exists in your own country. Mm. Just a very brief point on uh, Emma Harper's question, which is, I think, just to reinforce what, what Sue's been saying, that um, our energy system is fundamentally changing. We're going from a place where it was basically like um, our electricity system ran on a system that was like, have a big thing somewhere and we'll, put, we'll burn more stuff in that big thing when we need more energy. Um, similarly, in lots of our transport is based on burning stuff to drive, to drive around. There's a, on this topic, there's a, there's a one, they're really nice, um, it's an advert for Nissan Leaf cars where they imagine a world where everything was just run by burning stuff from your radio to your kettle to your hairdryer sort of thing. So our energy system is fundamentally changing. And one of the really good things that the government is doing is looking at uh, an energy um, strategy which brings together um, transport, electricity and heat because there are really neat interplays between those things. So um, the role of electrification and electri electrifying vehicles, whether that's bicycles or cars, can play a really neat balancing role in terms of smoothing out the demand um, through the day if people are charging up during the night and so on. So these things can work really nicely together. Thank you for that. I want to move on to emissions from agriculture and the land use sector. Emma Harper is going to lead on that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Robin Matthews uh, said that, that uh, agricultural industry has reduced emissions from fertilisers and animals. And one of the things I learned at the Quality Meets Scotland dinner last week was that the... Um, they said that if their cattle were healthy and their beasts were healthy, then emissions would be reduced. But they were referring to bovine viral diarrhoea and eradication of that. Um, but we need to establish baselines of how do we measure emissions from agriculture. Do you have any further thoughts or information about that? It might be Andy or Robin answers that. Yeah, I, mean, I think the whole question of baselines is very important in agriculture. I mean, there's, there's um, a tremendous variation in, in estimates of a lot of the, the emissions from there. Um, perhaps not so much with the livestock, but certainly with other, you know, other uh, land uses, um, peatland, for example, peatland restoration, and um, and that that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's an area that really needs to be focused on, uh, is to, to uh, improve the methodology of, of baselines. Um, on the uh, point of the livestock, I mean, certainly, I guess, um, a major focus within the industry is to try and improve the efficiency, and, and part of that is to uh, improve the health of animals. The, the um, logic being that uh, if you um, are able to... Uh, maintain the health of animals, then productivity per unit um, GHG emitted is is improved. But I think one thing we have to be careful of there is the 
Um, it, it, efficiency is one thing, but it's actually the total figure, the total emissions that's the important thing that we're trying to reduce. And um, if the uh, net effect of actually increasing the efficiency also increases the total amount through perhaps an increase in numbers again, even though the efficiency is, is, has improved, then the overall emission figures are, are, not, um, are not being helped. So I think we need to be careful about uh, distinguishing between the efficiency um, uh, drive and the actual total, total emissions uh, that, we, that we're interested in trying to reduce. Um, yeah, I think, does that answer your question at the moment? Um, I think yeah. we also I had a conversation with Andy earlier about fertilisers and proper usage of them, not just nitrogen everywhere, but do you have any further thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so I suppose that the... Two, two things very quickly to say, one of which is um, if we look around, not just in Scotland, but elsewhere, you know, there are three obvious areas where, where there are interventions that can change things. One's around soils and, and um, ensuring maintenance of organic soils, peatlands and so on. One's around the nitrogen issue, which is fertiliser and making sure that what you've got is precision agriculture. So you're actually ensuring you're only using sufficient to deliver the, the needs of the soils because we see a huge wastage in some farming systems. Um, and, and the third one is around food waste. So, uh, and, and actually, how do you reduce food waste right the way through the whole cycle, um, which isn't just a, an on-farm issue, it's actually a wider f um, food industry issue. So I think there are, there are w we held a, a workshop last week on, on these, and, and we haven't yet got the results back, but, but those are the things that will feed into the consultation with the government. Um, and I do know the government have been looking very hard at precision farming and farming issues with different stakeholders in the farming community about what are the sort of appropriate uh, methods they can use. One of the big challenges which we flagged in our earlier conversation was it, what you see, tend to see, are leader farms who are very, very good at doing things outstandingly well. The big challenge is how do you get some of the best practice from there integrated right the way across the industry and that is a genuine challenge for for all industries but i think farming in particular um but and, and uh, other than that I'd, I'd echo robin's point and in fact the, the point made by lord devon last week about the need for better baselines to understand what the interventions actually mean and what happens okay in terms in terms of baselines aren't we completely missing a trick on peat ones because we don't seem to measure upland peat ones we don't measure the impact of re-wetting peat ones and yet we talk about how important peat ones are. Um, there is a huge amount of work, in fact, that um, uh, James Hutton Institute is leading on, which is about understanding better um, the carbon flow through peatlands uh, and then trying to put it into measurement frameworks that are acceptable at a national level. Um, so there is a huge amount of underlying work. The extent to which they're robust or not, I think I would leave to, to Robin to comment on. Okay. Yeah. I think the, the big uh, problem with the peatlands, and certainly it's got you know, huge potential. I, I think the RPP2 estimates something like um, 8% uh, through, through peatland restoration could contribute to 8% reduction in the, in the total emissions for Scotland. So, so it's a, not an insignificant amount. Um, the big problem, I think, uh, well, there's a couple of problems. One, one is the huge spatial variability in this um, across the country. So. Um, it's not like a sort of agricultural field where if you do something to one, one part of it, then it's going to have a similar effect elsewhere in the same field. But um, so, so, so that's one problem, I think, is trying to estimate the, the benefit of peatland restoration is, is being able to extrapolate from small plot areas where maybe measurements are going on to, to wide areas such as the flow country in the north there. So um, the other issue, I think, is the question of re-wetting on, on methane emissions. Um, uh, by re-wetting, you're, of course, introducing an anaerobic conditions back into it again, and that, um, rather than producing CO2, which is greenhouse gas, clearly, um, it, all, it switches to producing methane, which is another more powerful greenhouse gas. So there's a balance there to be, to be struck um, in terms of the amount of restoration that, that will, the impact that restoration will have. Um, the current thinking on that is that it's really just a pulse of methane. It's, it's perhaps lasts for two or three years or so. So in the long term, it, it, is, a, it is a benefit to, to restore peatland. Um, some of my colleagues, as Andy mentioned, have done calculations on that, and some of those are actually in the RPP2 and uh, will be in um, the RPP3 as well, hopefully, um, where a, a, a modest area of 21,000 hectares per year of restoration can contribute... Um, as I said before, about 8% uh, towards the reduction uh, at the national level. So, so it's not insignificant. 
So um, I suppose in terms of missing a trick, um, yes, we are. The, the problem at the moment is that it's not incorporated into the, the national inventories, and so it's not possible just yet to, um, to estimate how much it will have, or at least to, to have it, um, any peat and restoration counted for within the national in inventories. Um, there are discussions at the moment to, to do that, but I think a, a large part of the uh, problem uh, relating to incorporation is, is again, this um, uncertainty in the, the baselines and the, uh, the emission reductions, the carbon sequestration rates that are going on through restoration. Uh, Kate Forbes. It's, it's quite a simple question. Why aren't we uh, planting enough trees and how can we sort that? Well, if I I'll have a go at answering, maybe Andy's got some more questions and the others um, uh, more, more answers. But, um, yeah, I mean, we have fallen short. I, I think uh, the, um, the, the target is 10,000 hectares per year, and if I remember rightly, it's something in the order of about eight, seven or 8,000 at the moment per year that we're, they were planting. Um, I think may, part of the problem, I guess, is, that, uh, is the resistance that a lot of uh, farmers and uh, land managers have towards... Um, planting trees, I think part of this is the identity. A farmer is, is a farmer and he's, um, he or she is there to produce food, essentially. That's, that's, that's what they see themselves as, as food producers, um, tenders of the land, I guess. And uh, trees don't, um, don't figure in that quite so much. I think there's a natural inborn resistance to planting trees. They would rather see product, productive land being used for um, producing rather than planting trees. A, a number of European countries, of course, that is different. And um, I think, again, it's a, it's a culture change that probably needs to take place, um, perhaps through education or um, uh, persuasion some way, um, economic or at least um, financial inducement may be another, another way. But, but somehow we need to find ways of... Um, of changing the culture, I think, of land managers to, to see value in planting trees more. Okay, uh, Alexander Burnett. Thank you. I sh should just first make reference to my agricultural holdings in the Register of Interest. Um, a uh, question really for, for Andy, and I'm glad you mentioned food waste. Um, with food never having been cheaper uh, and production probably never more undervalued, uh, do you think Brexit offers some opportunities uh, for changes in the subsidy system which will actually have a positive impact on the food waste? Um, the, the blunt answer is I genuinely don't know, um, and I'm, I, I, I'm not familiar enough with how the whole food system works to be able to offer a thought on that. I do know that it was, it was one of the big discussion points at our meeting um, uh, 10 days ago, um, and certainly I'm very happy to feed back some of the conversations that came out of that once they become, they'll, they'll be made available in the next week or so, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortably outside my, my uh, territory on that one. So. Right, um, I think we'll move on and look at, uh, we've covered the housing sector quite extensively, but I think Mark wants to come in with a couple of small... Yeah, thanks, I mean, Just one follow-up question. We've spoken a bit this morning about the uh, energy efficiency national infrastructure priority. Um, and obviously we've got the existing homes alliance pushing for every existing home in Scotland to be, to be category C. That, that's a big job. Uh, and I'm just wondering beyond the issue of budget, uh, what, what else needs to be in place? I mean, do we actually know how to do that? Um, have we got enough people trained up? Uh, do we need more college places? What, what, what do we actually need to bring that into fruition? Or is it just simply a matter of setting a target, putting budget into it, and letting it happen? Yeah. Sue. Okay. Um, the, big, the, the big answer is no. I mean, um, the, the energy efficiency of every house in, in Scotland is not going to be made to happen within the next decade. Um, does it need to? Now, that's another question, because obviously people who have a vested interest in making profit out of massive rollout of, of incentives, fiscal incentives to do that, are probably asking different questions from, say, you as MSPs, or how do I improve the quality of life of the people in the houses um, in my constituency? Um, now, uh, one thing I would promote for you is another idea, which is one that I've been working on with the New Zealand government, which is basically, what are you trying to look for? You're trying to look to keep people safe in their own homes, aren't you? And if you take somewhere like New Zealand, where they have a rapidly aging population, large, poorly designed houses, poorly constructed houses, etc. We've started this, um, and, and a lot of the elderly people then ending up in hospital with pneumonia and stuff like that. So we've started this program for 
buy your gran a cozy corner for Christmas. And it's basically the idea in increasingly extreme weather events, whether it's overheating or extreme cold, when the lights go out, which they do increasingly, is that there is one room, a safe haven. You've got an energy efficient sanctuary for a cozy corner for the winter. And in Australia, I'm working with Adel in Adelaide in South Australia on buy your ground a cool corner for Christmas. Um, these are sort of like safe havens. And I, I think that just a new approach to this, to, by saying to people and to designers, when you design a new building, where's your safe climate room for extreme cold? Where's your extreme, you know, safe climate room for heat waves and stuff like that? And just start incrementally. Put in the insulation in the roof of that one room, the double glazing, get rid of the drafts, the nice warm um, carpet, and so on. So I think that um, the idea that we're going to make any, every building energy efficient is just not going to happen. Do we want to make sure that every one of our citizens is climate safe in their own homes? Yes. So I think we have to think about it differently. Idea. Of course, mm -hmm. families crammed into one room could be, could be a bit problematic. Um, can I ask Robin? Just uh, what yeah, uh, the, the first thing on, on that I want to say is that the health element to tackle the energy efficiency is incredibly important. Um, and it's, there's um, UK guidance, um, I've forgotten the name of the body, but it's a, it's a health advising um, NDPB. And they've recommended that the minimum level we get housing to is a energy performance level C, because that's when we get it to that level, that starts reducing um, the, the very real health risks and indeed increased mortality that happens um, in winter because of, in part, um, poor energy efficiency in our housing stock. Um, I think what I want to say in answer to your question, Mark, is that, um, first of all, this is, um, in climate terms, this is a, a no-brainer, but I think in, it speaks to so many different priorities of, of government as well. It's, it speaks to health, it speaks to um, the fuel poverty, social justice agenda. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why there's so much support from different organisations for the vision that the existing Homes Alliance um, sets out. I think what needs to... So the, the designation of energy efficiency as a national infrastructure project is really important because I think it changes the mindset. It says this is a, this is a long-term thing that we're going to do as a, as a country what are the things, the, the steps that we need to put in place to get to that point? So I think it is a very relevant metaphor to say that, you know, we set out to say we're going to build a new railway line or something like that. And you then decide what are the steps that we need to put in place? What do we need to, what's the work that we need to do with um, the business supply chain? What's the work we need to do with training? What are we going to do in terms of um, placing requirements in terms of um, apprenticeships or, or something like that and skills, the skills kind of side of things? Um, and I think to business, that say, that's setting out the long-term agenda, saying that for 10 years, we're going to put money into energy efficiency, both public and private. Um, that really transforms the kind of the business confidence and the perspective that com comes from that, that side of things. So um, the last thing I think I want to say is that there was a really good, um, in the alongside the programme for government, the Scottish government said that they were going to put £20 million into energy efficiency measures as part of a, a stimulus package to reflect the, the economic uncertainty following the EU referendum. I think that, that's, that was a really good signal of intent that this energy efficiency stacks up alongside any other kind of infrastructure um, project just from a, um, an economic point of view. Um, and the, the very last thing I will say was that Andy made a point earlier about things that go alongside it, so the regulation side of things, and the regulation can act as a way of leveraging in private money to, to go into this. So um, I would really encourage the committee to have a, str have a strong focus on that regulation side of things. Uh -huh. Okay. I, I'm conscious of time. We need to move on and deal with, um, first of all, the waste sector. Morris Golden will lead on that. And then Claudia, I think, has got a question around the public sector. Morris. Hi. Obviously, we've made considerable progress in the waste sector with respect to cutting emissions. I just wondered what your thoughts were on where we go next in that sector. Richard. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think there's huge potential. Zero Waste Scotland produced a report a couple of years ago about the potential for moving to a circular economy, so using materials much more efficiently and uh, reducing thereby the energy going into producing raw materials and the carbon consequences of doing that. And that suggested we could save 11% of current emissions by 2030. So that 11%, that's as big as closing a whole coal-fired coal power station. So that's a huge opportunity. I think the potential delay in that is that whilst the SNP have promised uh, 
circular economy and zero waste bill. There's no mention of that in the programme for government as anything coming soon. So that could be several years away. Uh, and so I think, again, there might be one or two key measures that would be worth looking at putting in the climate bill to get that ball rolling to get those emissions savings because it might be disappointing to wait four years before we have a big bill that does much more on that. Okay. Anybody else want to come in on that? No? Good. Okay. Um, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I don't know whether this, this will be as quick. Um, panel views on the public sector and the contribution that the public sector could make um, increasingly towards our cutting our carbon emissions. So the public sector obviously is facing an incredibly challenging time in terms of, of its budgets. Um, so again, one of the challenges has been two things, one of which is losing the skill sets and the knowledge within the different parts of the public sector that will enable that type of change to take place, and B is having the capital to actually spend into that space. So I think what we need to see and what we are starting to see are very different models by which, for example, I'm thinking about Edinburgh or Glasgow, where they're bringing forth um, their, their um, uh, sort of essentially wholly owned energy company to essentially act as a mechanism, a delivery mechanism, to start making some of these major changes like massive deep public re retrofits of public buildings. So I think we, we do need to start seeing some of that because the idea that it will come out of recurrent funding with the skill sets in the, in the local authorities, for example, or indeed in the NHS, it, it's just not going to happen. So I think there is a very strong need to see how we can use, as I said, these different models by which you can actually deliver changes and lever in other funding as well to make it happen. Okay. Anybody else? Robin, uh, Richard, sorry. Um, just briefly, um, uh, obviously we are moving to a phase now where public bodies are going to have to report on what they've done on the public sector duty. I think that will be very helpful because there have been some excellent examples since the Climate Act was passed. So NHS Scotland, a number of local authorities have done SEPA have done really good work taking that duty seriously and many others have done not very much. So the fact that they will now have to report will concentrate the minds of chief executives on what are we going to say we've done, how can we say we've done something. I think the, the broader problem is that the public sector duty is a duty for every public sector body to make a fair contribution to delivering on Scotland's climate targets. And that's quite vague. So if you're enthusiastic, you can say, well, we'll do a lot because we are a local authority and we should do a lot. Uh, and if you're not enthusiastic, you can say, well, our fair contribution isn't really very much because it's quite difficult for us. So, so a bit more direction from government and parliament on what's actually expected of local authorities in different sectors would be very helpful in getting the benefits that are there to be gained. Point, uh, Robin two, Parker. Two very quick points. Um, first of all, the public sector has a huge um, uh, physical presence, so all the buildings and stuff it has, so the energy, improving the energy efficiency of that. There's support that's been been done by um, some of the bodies for, for doing that, but that's that's an area we can go further. And then second, I was going to highlight, I think there's a theme across the last few questions that, that's come out. Um, so I mentioned regulation and energy efficiency in the private sector, um, Rhys Golden uh, mentioned waste sector, and then in terms of the public sector, I think across all of those things, there's a theme that all of those things had in some way were powers within um, the last climate change bill, I think, so the public reporting duty, um, things like plastic bag tax was in the last climate bill, um, uh, I think the powers to do regulation and energy efficiency in the private sector, and across those examples, there's one of those that was taken forward, uh, and were well, two of those that were taken forward, one of those which weren't. So I think two, and then similarly, those things were all in previous RPPs, and uh, some of them have been taken forward, again, regulation efficiency hasn't been taken forward. So I think it's maybe a really useful job um, that just potentially just desk piece of work that the committee could do, which is go back through previous RPPs, go back through previous climate bills, identify which things were taken forward, which things Scottish government said they would do, which haven't been taken forward. Um, and that would provide you to, things to push on to be in the next climate action plan. OK, thank you. We have a question about the implications of the Paris Agreement on, on the targets. Angus McDonald. OK, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, given the time, time constraints, um, I'll skip my, my preamble. Um, so can I ask the panel uh, what your views are on the compatibility of Scotland's existing climate targets with the goals reflected in the Paris Agreement and what implications the Paris Agreement has for the development of the climate change plan? 
So the, the UK Committee on Climate Change said in their report to the Scottish Government in March, looking at the cumulative budget that they have to advise on, that pursuing efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, which is the phrase from the Paris Agreement, would require a tighter cumulative emissions budget and therefore imply more ambitious targets in 2050. So they're saying, and they're, they're going to produce advice to the UK government next month, and then advice for Scotland more specifically later, they're saying, yes, we need to have more ambitious targets to say that Scotland is doing its fair bit to help deliver the more ambitious end of the Paris Agreement. So in the advice they give us on new targets for the climate bill, they will no doubt be talking about 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement and urging us to go more ambitious. I think one of the difficulties is that the climate plan, the RPP, is being written right now under the existing bill with the existing targets with a bit of a nod to Paris and 1.5, but without really knowing how to put that into numbers. So whilst the civil servants think the new climate plan is going to be very, very ambitious, it may actually be a little unambitious compared to what we need to do our bit under the Paris Agreement. And so we'll be revisiting that when we're sitting here in six months' time, talking about the new climate bill and the targets there. We'll be looking at how can we tighten the targets up and therefore what more action do we need? How do we tighten the climate plan up? And there's no perfect order to do these things in, so we're doing them in the order that the current Climate Act says. Uh, but I think as you discuss the climate plan, as that comes in front of you, it's worth remembering that we need to revisit that quite soon to up its ambition so that it's delivering on tougher targets that we'll be agreeing through the climate bill process. Okay, Richard, just, just to be clear, um, I think you talk in your written evidence about hitting the 80% target much sooner than 2050. In essence, are you saying that we need to target 80% by 2030? Um, I, I think no one can really answer that question yet. So the Times modelling, which will look at the energy sector and mm. help us in, help inform the climate change plan, will give us some information. But I think the problem with any computer model is that it's quite good at telling you what you should do next year and in five years, and it's OK in 10 years. But in 34 years' time, when we get to 2050, it will have really no clue. So if I could just illustrate that. If we think backwards 34 years, so this was 1982 and I'd got permission to get off school early to come and talk to you, we would be thinking about renewables. We'd be thinking about the 10% that comes from hydro. Wind power, well, there's some stuff happening in California, but that's not for us. We wouldn't have been thinking of offshore wind. We would have, at that point, have thought there would be lots more nuclear reactors in the UK because that was the government's plan at the day. Uh, electric vehicles, someone's doing something funny in California, but that's not for us. So 34 years ago, we would have had no idea about the solutions that we're going to put in today's climate change plan. So predicting exactly what we can achieve in 2050, which the Times model will try to do, is a bit fictional. So for the couple of decades that come, the Times model is a very good indicator of what we think we're going to do, and therefore the level of emissions reduction we can achieve. Further out, it's going to be very inaccurate, and it's better for us to be thinking, what does climate science, what does the Paris Agreement need us to do to get to the right emissions reductions, even though we can't spell out exactly the pathway? Because who knows, who has any plan that will clearly exactly deliver in 34 years' time? But wouldn't the fair share approach require us to hit the 80% by 2030? Um, I, again, I think there are... There are there are very different numbers because thinking okay. about fair shares and historical responsibility, there are different dates you can look at that responsibility from. So is it from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? Is it from the 1830s? Is it from only 1990 when we started talking about this? And it also requires an analysis of the, um, the ability of countries to make changes. So a poorer country probably has less financial capacity to make changes to reduce emissions, whereas we as a richer country can invest in things in a bigger way, like our housing stock, to make more rapid reductions. So all of that comes in, and I'm sure we'll be talking that, about that as we develop the climate change targets. But the number of, yes, 80% should be achieved by 2030, that's probably in the right kind of ballpark. So that's the kind of ambition we should be thinking about. OK, that's good. Uh, Rowan Parker uh, and Sudov. I wanted to... So what, did, what were the messages that came out of Paris? Clearly very historic 
moment with the international agreement, but I think there was there's two almost kind of contradictory messages around action. Um, one of them were all the stories of, that, that came to light as part of the build-up to the Paris Agreement of different actions, uh, different actions that different countries uh, were putting in place. So, for example, the, the huge levels of investment in renewables that China was making, the financial commitments that um, the U.S. government were putting in place, messages like that. Um, and then, secondly, but equally. Um, the message that existing government contributions, commitments for emissions reductions were insufficient to even keep us in around about the three degree climate change uh, uh, level. So the, both of those say that action is, can be increased and that uh, we must step up action even to keep, even to get us down to kind of two degrees um, and then down to, to one and a half degrees. So what, what Scotland's role can be and what the climate action plan and the, uh, the climate bill can do, I think is, we need to have we need to be able to go back to climate talks in future with even more stories of how we as Scotland are leading. At the minute we can go to those talks and say we've done lots on renewable electricity, we had the hundred percent target, we had a really good climate bill. But yeah, you know, I would love to be able to go back in a few years and say that we've got an energy efficiency plan. Uh, there's a national program helping insulate every house in Scotland to get a C uh, rating. That's something we could tell to other, other countries that in showing our, our leading role. And that's really important in terms of the historical responsibility. The, the first consultation on the first climate change bill started off with the historical perspective of Scotland's leading role in bringing about the industrial revolution. And the, our next responsibility is to play a leading role in bringing about the, the zero carbon uh, revolution. Um, and the last thing is that I think the Another key message that was coming out of Paris was the importance of setting a zero, a zero emissions target. So um, the CCC has been on the receiving end of a lot of letters from the Scottish government, but I think another another letter they could be receiving uh, should be receiving is what would what would a zero target for Scotland um, be the right date? Uh, what would be the right date for a zero uh, target? And then lastly, obviously, um, I think for UK government. Um, there's the important job of ratifying Paris, ratifying the Paris Agreement, particularly reflecting the Brexit um, implications. Okay, Andy Kerr. Just, just very quickly, I mean, I'd, I'd echo a lot of what uh, we've just heard, but I think uh, it's worth saying that almost all the countries that signed up to Paris and are ratifying it have absolutely no idea how they're actually going to meet those targets in 20, 30 years' time. So there isn't some magical thing out there. So I think, as Scotland, we are one of the leader countries. We actually have the know-how in the private sector, public sector, around the civic society. So we need to be taking, we need to be bold and challenge people to say that we can do it, but there are also economic benefits from selling that know-how abroad. Um, and so that is something that, again, quite a lot of people are developing ideas around. So I think there is a there is a real opportunity for Scotland to take a lead in this space. Yes. Sue. I think we'll never meet these targets if we continue in our business as usual stance. Here we've got the promotion of regulations, we've got the promotion of new products into the markets. These regulations are written by people who make money from putting products into buildings. Scotland should lead the world in looking at new generations of approaches for solutions that don't require more and more machines and more and more products and more and more energy use. And I think that if we looked simply at a future where we started to legislate and facilitate a world that was increasingly run on house by house, building by building, local energy by simply opening the window for as long as possible to maintain comfort by just running local buildings on um, renewable energy. There is an argument to be made that you're not making the vast amounts of profits from larger systems approaches, but what you would do is you would be um, making every individual building not only um, self-sufficient in energy, more increasingly self-sufficient, but also um, you would be providing resilience at all levels throughout society and encouraging local business and economies. So I think we have to radically rethink what we're putting in the regulations and this dependence on machines for solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, two final questions around RPP3. Uh, they may well invite simple one-word answers. I hope they do anyway, given the time constraints. Um, the CCC uh, said that RPP3 should represent an improvement on RPP2 by including clear and measurable objectives, focus on a core set of policies that will have the biggest impact and enable effective monitoring of progress. Do you agree with that? And the second question is, realistically, can RPP3 
given the timing, reflect the potential implications of leaving the European Union? Robin Parker. The, I, I laid out some of my criticisms of the, the second RPP earlier. So I think the, the new climate action plan, is, as Richard said earlier, is off to a really good start with the basis of the energy model. And that energy model should provide some of the basis, enable, enable the Scottish Government to provide this policy will deliver this much emissions and we will get to this point by this sort of time sort of thing. Um, and the other thing I'd suggest to the, uh, perhaps suggest to the committee is that I think having the RPP is a very <coughs> big document. It's a strategy across the entire government, uh, more or less. Um, and you have quite a limited window in which to review that document and work out whether it stacks up well enough or not. So I think one of the, in order to prepare for that, one of the things that the committee could do is work out a kind of a, a set of criteria or, or something similar, perhaps building on what the CCC have said. And so you've got that criteria, you, you get the RPP uh, in January and you can say, right, does this RPP match up? You can judge it against the criteria that you've already set out and you've already shared with Scottish Government. Uh, that wasn't a one word answer, thank you. <laughs> Andy Kerr. Okay, so the, the answer to the first question is yes. Um, the answer to the second question is nobody seems to know what Brexit is, so until we do, we can't tell whether the climate change plan will reflect it. Yeah. Uh, Richard Dixon. <laughs> right, well, thank you for that. Yes. So, so I agree with Andy, um, but also the, the key thing about the RPP3 is, as it says, measurable, is can we tell at budget time, is it being funded? So when you look at the financial budget for Scotland, can you tell, are we on track to deliver on the things that are in the new climate plan? And so far, that's been very difficult every year. So the better it links to the budget process so yeah. that you can say, yes, we're on track or no, what's happened to this policy, the, the better we will be off. OK, thank you. Uh, Rowan Matthews. And the only other point I, I would make about the RPP3, I think, is the level to which displacement um, of emissions might occur abroad, and, and particularly in the agricultural sector. Um, I mean, we've, as we mentioned before about the, the livestock, we've managed to reduce that OK, but... Um, we haven't actually reduced our consumption uh, at all, and essentially what's happening is we're just exporting the um, emissions abroad. And so I think uh, in terms of monitoring and account accounting of that, we need to somehow find ways of taking that into account as well. Maybe um, consumption accounting may be, may be the way forward there. But it, it's a good start, and I think we need to uh, build on it. OK. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. It's been very useful for the committee. Uh, thank you for attending. I'm not going to call a short five-minute break to swap the witnesses and uh, suspend.
Okay. The uh, third item on the agenda is to take evidence on the draft public appointments and public bodies, etc. Scotland Act 2003, Treatment of Crown Estate Scotland, Interim Management, as specified authority, Order 2016. Can I welcome Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary, David Mallon, Head of Crown Estate Strategy Unit, and Douglas Kerr, Solicitor Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And can I ask the Minister to speak to the instrument? Thanks very much, uh, Convener, and the officials are here to answer the really complicated questions. Uh, about uh, some of the technicalities involved in all of this. Um, obviously, the draft order has been laid to ensure that appointments to the interim body, Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management, can be regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. I wrote to the committee on the 30th of June, um, setting out the actions I was taking to prepare for Scotland taking early control of the management and revenue of the Crown Estate's assets. Um, and in that letter, what I proposed was to set up an interim public body to undertake these functions and that appointments to that body should be regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life. And it's my intention that the new interim body will be established and take up its full powers in April 2017, um, subject, of course, to the UK government itself completing the transfer um, and Parliament, our Parliament approving the order in Council to set up the interim body. In order to have the chair in place six months prior to the body taking on its full functions and in line with the Audit Scotland recommendation on establishing and merging public bodies, um, I wish to appoint a chair as soon as possible. The chair will be in place to assist in the appointment process for the chief executive and board members prior to the body taking on its functions in April 2017. Um, I think it's important that the appointment of the first chair and board uh, which will have full responsibility, full responsibility for setting the agenda for the new interim body, is fully transparent and subject to the high quality of external scrutiny that the Commissioner can provide. Um, I, just as an explanation of what's going on, I'm, I'm going to read out the, the technicalities. It's going to sound a little bit chicken and egg, but there's really no way around that, I'm afraid. The addition of Crown Estate Scotland interim management to the relevant schedule to the Public Appointments and Public Bodies Scotland Act 2003 does follow recent precedent when new public bodies are set up. To regulate the appointments officially under the 2003 Act, the new interim body will be added to the list of regulated bodies by the Order in Council that will, again, subject to the will of Parliament, establish the new interim body on its coming into force. Until then, this order will enable a representative from the Commissioner's Office to provide assistance during recruitment of the Chair by having the new interim body treated as if it were listed in the relevant schedule of the 2003 Act until such a time as the order in Council is in force and the new interim body is fully regulated. I hope you all grasp that because I had to read it about three times. <laughs> <laughs> But it is, it is one of these kind of slightly chicken and egg scenarios that we get into because of the 2003 Act. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. That's why we're doing this uh, um, in the way we are at the moment. Um, this is just to ensure that s sort of getting these people into place can be done under the auspices uh, of uh, um, what Parliament thinks is the most transparent way of making uh, appointments. Right. Um, can I invite any members who have any questions for the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, well, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask, perhaps getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, the time frames for the next order uh, setting up the new body, do we know how, are, how those are progressing? Because I gather there are some difficulties with the UK government around the progression of this. Well, I mean, obviously we have to negotiate with the UK government. The, the, the devolution of the Crown Estates has not taken place exactly, yet. Yeah. Um, we anticipate it taking place at some point before the 1st of April 2017, but we are dependent entirely on the UK government then in order to progress that. Um, uh, if, if that doesn't happen, I'm not entirely quite sure how we'll, how we'll, we'll manage, but the, um, that, that is the plan. Now, there are current conversations taking place, as you might expect, about some of the financials around this as well, uh, mm. because that's part and parcel of the of the of the process. Um, and the, I know that the negotiations of the Treasury haven't concluded, 
Um, yeah. uh, is that really at the present the only substantive hold-up? Um, yes, we're awaiting a further draft of the transfer scheme from the UK government. Uh, we're told that's uh, going to arrive very soon. Uh, the other um, aspect to the process is um, the hopefully the order uh, to be tabled uh, in the Scottish Parliament, which is the you know, the, the, the product of the consultation that was launched at the same time as this order was laid in, in Parliament, which would provide the regulatory framework for the new interim body, and we hope uh, to weigh that order in the Scottish Parliament in October. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, um, I think it was last week we, we discussed this issue, and well, I think we asked that we, the committee be kept updated on progress around the, the issue with the UK government, because obviously this is something we're taking a considerable interest in. Yeah, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, I mean, when we know, you'll know. But uh, at the moment, um, there are still some things that we don't know. And we're operating on the basis that everything will go according to the intended timetable, so that we will be in a position on the 1st of April to have, have in place that landing pad for the transfer. Um, and at the same time, my officials are also getting ready to put the consultation out, which will be for the longer term uh, uh, plans for the Crown Estate, because uh, you know the, the, there is a commitment for us to be looking at communities and, and that further devolution. Um, so there will be running alongside this process, there will be a consultation on that because that will require primary legislation in this parliament. But none of that can take place. That primary legislation can't take place until after we've actually had the devolution. Okay. Nobody has any, any other questions at this stage? Okay, so we're going to move to the debate on the motion, uh, on agenda item three. Can I invite the cabinet secretary to speak to and move the motion? Um, I would like to, I don't have a text for the motion. I'd like to uh, uh, simply move that the committee accept uh, the uh, order as laid. Oh, I have a text. That the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee do recommend that the public appointments and public bodies, etc. Scotland Act 2003, Treatment of Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management as Specified Authority, uh, Order 2016, Draft, be approved. <laughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I invite uh, members, any members wishing to speak on this? No. Can I then invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up if she feels necessary? Don't think Thank that's you for necessary. that. So I put the question on the motion. The question is that motion uh, S5M01328 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. Yes. We're, so we're all agreed. Mm -hmm. The committee's report will confirm the outcome of the debate. Um, and can I, can I ask if members are content to delegate the signing off of the report to the convener? Yeah. Okay. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and our officials for a, a brief and delayed uh, appearance before the committee today. Uh, thank you. We now will move to agenda item five, which is further subordinate legislation. The fifth item on the agenda is for the committee to consider a negative instrument as listed on the agenda. Um, I refer, that is the Water Environment Shellfish Water Protected Areas Designation Scotland Order 2016, SSI 2016-251. I refer members to the paper. Can I ask for any comments that members might have? Emma Harper. Um, I welcome this. Um, you know, the Marine protect, Protected Area for Loch Ryan, which is in the area that I'm looking after. Um, but I would like to note that I will seek some further clarification from the government regarding the potential impact that this protected area designation might have on the current harbour regeneration at Stranraer East Pier. Okay. Right. Does anybody else have any comments to make? If that's the case, then can I ask whether the committee has agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Okay, thank you. Agenda item six is the appointment of an EU reporter. Um, paragraph four of the paper outlines the role of the EU reporter. In addition, paragraph five outlines a proposed expanded role for the reporter in relation to reporting to the committee on issues that arise from the Brexit vote that are relevant to the committee's remit. If there are no comments on the paper, are there any nominations for someone to fill the role of reporter? Can I invite nominations? I'd like to nominate David Stewart. Uh, um, so we have a proposal and a second for David Stewart. Do we have any other nominations? 
No. Does David Stewart accept that appointment? Yeah, thank you, Convener, and thank the committee for their faith. Excellent. That's, that's good. I'm sure you'll do a very good job on that. We look forward to hearing, hearing from you on the subject. OK, I'll move on to uh, the future meeting details. At its next meeting on the 27th of September, the committee will take evidence from the Committee on Climate Changes Subcommittee on Adaptation. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery, such as it is, be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.